Oh, okay. All right, everything running, I think, ready to go. Let's start with the midterm survey before we jump back to this unit six. Uh, first of all, it's set up as a quiz, so it shows one answer as correct, which is always strongly agree with a bit. Uh, I didn't set this up that way. It's the <laughs> departmental one. <laughs> so uh, we asked uh, if you're confident to succeed in this module. Uh, and many were at least partially, but uh, some were not. So, were a few. A few were not. Uh, I hope we can change that till the end. Uh, again, it's yeah. It, it would be more useful to know what exactly the the reasons are than just the fact. But maybe uh, we can dig that out. Okay, I feel connected with other students and staff on the module. Uh, Many, many agree, uh, and a few not too much. Um, I wonder what we can do about that. Uh, I mean, you you come to the sessions. It's not it's not really a seminar lecture. So I, I know there's little interaction between the audience uh, in the lectures, the tutorials maybe a bit more. Uh, I've. Uh, I, I had a group assessment in the past, but everyone hated it. <laughs> it was it was always a hassle to get the group set up because it was right at the beginning. Uh, it often caused problems when people still switched modules. And I feel half of the groups felt like it's not fair because they were unequal in their uh, engagement in the assessment. Uh, so I decided it's not that helpful. It might help for the connected bit, but again, only a, a small group then. That's an interesting one. Do you believe you're contributing to the module effectively? And at least a large majority says they do, so that's that's helpful. If you're not, that's the only one where I can say, maybe uh, tap your own nose and, and check if there's uh, reasons for that that we can get rid of. Um, okay, I understand whether how I will be assessed on the module. Um, many seem to agree, um, and a few not. So hopefully that has changed a bit with the posts about the exam as well. If you have specific questions, of course, you can ask. Uh, the, the basic structure is, is fixed well in advance, the different components of the assessment. So the question is probably only about what is covered in each part. Uh, then there were uh, lots of free text questions. These are usually the more helpful ones. Now, uh, I wasn't sure if I should publish those because they were intended to be just seen by us. So I, I won't publish them in full, but I, I summarized them here a bit. So uh, I want to point out a few points that, that people raised. Uh, the, the biggest one was uh, people asked about the exam questions. Uh, so there's a few more examples up now. Um, I hope that helped a bit for that. Uh, I think an, another common comment was either the whole thing's too fast and we need more fundamentals, or please more puzzles and more links between the assessments and the course, which are uh, to some degree um, in contradiction, I think. Um, in particular, so there's a certain level of uh, of material that we have to cover for that to count as a master's level module. There's accreditation, they look at what is the level that's, uh, that the things are assessed at. So uh, as much as we all love uh, bookwork questions all over the exam, uh, that's not something we can do. Uh, definitely not at MSc level. Uh, so there's a, a tension between putting more fundamentals into the lecture and keeping it at a reasonable pace for the things where we have to dig a little deeper. So it's, uh, the question, I guess, for you is, if there are specific fundamentals 
where you would think they would have helped you more to see to see more detail. That would be useful. Uh, as always, we have this divide between people in advanced computer science courses and uh, conversion masters. And I mean, I don't know how, how well uh, this was covered in other modules. I think the conversion masters are really, really tough. They are promising you, you do in one year what people otherwise do in four years. That's just not really possible. You can do a large chunk of that if you're putting in a lot of effort in this one year. I think it's a really tough ride, no matter what prerequisites you bring. Uh, so the conversion masters usually have my respect because it's, it's just much more to cover. In a way, it's harder than the advanced computer science master. Uh, of course, that's relatively speaking. I mean, the, the topics are more advanced on the advanced computer science masters. There are other modules that are exclusive to that course that dig deeper, but they start from a different foundation. So in terms of the, the relative effort that you have to put in, the conversion masters are on the high end. I don't think I can, I can really take that away. Um, I tried to do this balance of going over some foundations, but relatively quickly, and then pointing out links where you can dig deeper. Uh, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, a bit related to that, a few people asked about specific Python code on the slides, whereas I know that other people are just learning Python and programming for the first time alongside. So uh, I didn't do much of that because I felt going into the specifics of how something would look in Python might quite might be quite distracting for this this other group. Uh, but that's that's just my feeling. I don't know. Um, if you have specific. Um, maybe, maybe we have, a, have to have a more open discussion on this, some, some Campus Wire post. If, if concrete code instead of pseudocode would be helpful. I think it's a double-edged sword, let me put it that way. Okay, there was some praise for the flexibility in the lectures, and uh, generally people seem to like Slido, or those who commented on it seemed positive. Not everyone said something about it. Uh, okay, another another regular one was um, people would like tutorials also be live streamed or recorded. Uh, I don't know how much this was just the train strikes recently or or in general. It's always useful to have the recording. Uh, I think at the moment we don't have the facilities in all rules in all rooms, and not all demonstrators are uh, deemed trained for that. It's it's kind of um, an effort question. Uh, setting up the recording for a one hour slot and then running straight to the next section in a different room is uh, it, it eats into the tutorial time or it needs prep time from the demonstrators and at the moment we're not asking for that uh, if some demonstrators do that that's kind of their uh, their personal extra engagement so i don't think we can count on that that's my my latest uh, my latest knowledge about this but it would definitely be helpful. The question is, how much do you crave recordings of the tutorials? Uh, is this something that would be more useful and save, sacrifice 10 minutes of the tutorial for the technical trouble to setting it up? That's the average time that usually people need. Uh, that, that's, that's not so clear to me if like the given circumstances would probably mean either record in li or live stream with some Zoom meeting and live with the fact that it, the recording's not necessarily great or the audio, if you have questions, it's not necessarily great. This the other the other legal question about recording student questions. So we'll probably have to ask permission of, of participants each time, but I don't think that's uh, a showstopper. I, I mean, uh, one could find ways around that, offer one tutorial that's not recorded, something like that. Okay, a, a last point that some people mentioned, or several people mentioned, is the language barrier. Uh, many, many students have English as second language, probably the majority on, on MSc level by far. Uh, that's again, uh, I know it's hard, I can maybe try to slow down in speaking a little bit. 
It's easier if you're focused and at home. So the live streamed lectures from home, I could focus much more on speaking slowly because you know that the other side will receive it over a cranky connection. And, and so it's easier to focus on being slow than in the room of people because you fall back to the natural conversation mode. Uh, and if there's five people in the room nodding, I guess, oh, you all got it, brilliant. But uh, the other 30, 40, whatever, um, may or may not have uh, followed. Uh, if you have any other, other comments that you would like to throw in that we could pick up on, uh, I think that was what the written comments were half an hour ago or so. Any thoughts? So I think the question about what fundamentals might be useful uh, and Python versus pseudocode might be something worth picking up on. Uh, maybe we'll just have a little poll and discussion on Campus Wire to uh, collect your specific thoughts on that um, beyond the just um, random comments and uh, the high level questions. Today's attendance code, same game as always. You're allowed to bring one handwritten A4 sheet, both sides of handwritten notes to the exam. So you can prepare, you can write as small as you want, as, you, as long as it's useful to you, whatever that means, mm -hmm. uh, whatever language, but it must be handwritten. The reason is I don't want people to copy these. The, the pedagogy behind this is uh, I've often prepared such things. Uh, we were often allowed to bring something like that or we had oral exams where we, you, you couldn't bring your sheet, but I made a sheet either way and I usually never looked at it in the exams where I was allowed to bring them. The, the act of making this, this sheet of all the facts that you think you might know is usually enough for you to memorize it. It's a cheap trick. Maybe it works for you as well. If it doesn't, you still have this sheet with you in your exam and it's a little psychological help to hold on to this piece of collected knowledge that you curated over your preparation time. Um, and of course, put definitions and things on it that are hard to memorize. I'm not really interested in your ability to memorize. It's one of the things that at least in these days with ubiquitous connectivity and, and Wikipedia and search and Stack Overflow. That's not the key, not the key skill I want to see from you. That's the, that's the last bit. I think the rest about the exam I said, there's a mock exam on Campus Wire now and there's a tutorial with a few additional transfer problems. Um, many of them cover things we'll only touch on now, so it, they, they might not make sense yet, but you see the question. Yeah. Okay, you're saying pseudocode is easier for you than English language prose or just sentences. I think that's fine. Yeah, it's uh, people often feel the other way around in this module. Uh, if you're from a conversion master specifically, maybe. Uh, I think it's fine. Usually pseudocode is okay. I'm also not, you know, I'm not interested in your English language skills per se, as long as I can understand what you mean. And it's reasonably precise, right? Uh, that's, uh, so if you can express yourself in mathematical formulas or in pseudocode, it's usually better. Um, If that helps, um, okay, I'm not 100% sure. I think you should be allowed to bring a dictionary, just English language dictionary, but I'm not 100% sure. That might be might be need, needed to check. Uh, 
I'm, I'm mixing it up between three countries, but the rules are now. Yeah. But it's, again, it should, uh, like, um, the, logic, the logic rule for me would be, it's not an English language test, so why would we stop you from bringing one? Could only be organizational reasons, right? If there's 300 students each bringing their book, someone has to briefly check that it's really just a dictionary and not your whatever uh, algorithms Bible from Pasta, <laughs> whoever, right? So that that might be an issue, and so it could be that it's it's restricted in some sense. But pseudocode by all means is good. Um, you, you should also have enough time on the exam to do things on some scrap paper on the side and then, ah, I forgot to bring the exam sheet. I'll, I'll bring it uh, in two weeks. Uh, but you, you usually have enough time to put things on scrap sheet and then copy it over in your nicest writing at the end or, or try to write legibly at the first round. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Pardon? Any advice for the person who has a really oh. bad handwriting? Uh, practice handwriting, I don't know. Uh, is we'll, we'll have to deal with uh, whatever you submit, but uh, any way you can make your, your marker happy is usually helpful, right? <laughs> Try, try to take your time. I think that's the only thing. Uh, the exam is not designed to be short on time. It's short on insight, maybe. At some point, you will run out of ideas for some of these transfer questions. It's not designed to be, uh, to be have that the time becomes the limiting factor. Uh, that said, of course, it helps if you practice these application questions, the, the, what, what, cover, what comes up in the class tests. Uh, you can practice these a few times, then you just get faster. So uh, you don't have infinite time. Yeah, other than that, like, uh, <laughs> try your best. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to exam markings, the favorite part of my job. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the favorite part of my job. Uh, or at least one of them, especially this unit, I, I really like a lot. I hope that doesn't scare you too much. Welcome back to COM 5 to 6, Efficient Algorithms. And the new exciting unit, Unit 6, will talk about text indexing. And that's, in, part, in a way, a problem we've looked at before, string matching, finding a pattern in a long string, but flipped on its head where this time we spent time on the text and then try to be really fast with the pattern. It's also, apart from this, uh, another area where we'll, we'll dig relatively deep, but we can, build, we can go there by little individual steps that, uh, where each step is, is really easy to follow or is very fundamental. But if you put them all together and you take a step back, you say, oof, how did we get there? This is amazing. It's some, some of the, the smartest and coolest ideas we'll see. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this as well. Uh, but we'll go slow and we'll, we'll spend some time on it. Uh, we'll, we'll cover some things that uh, you may have heard of. So uh, briefly inverted indices, but then mostly suffix trees and their friends. Um, if you haven't heard of those, like, then don't worry, you will. Uh, there's some generalizations of that. I don't know. I'm, um, I'm just listing these at the beginning so you can at the end refer back, but some of them might not help you too much at this point. Uh, as always, I want you to know not just that these things exist, but when they are good and what limitations they may have. Uh, and we'll look at, for some of these data structures mostly, there are some nice tricks to use them for, for more than the initial thing we designed them for and some cool algorithms. Let's start with um, setting the stage a bit for this. And what, what text indexing is all about. Um, it's also sometimes called offline text search. 
the idea is, as in, in string matching, we have a text and we have a pattern. We try to find, in the easiest way, exact matches, exact occurrences of the pattern as a substring of the text. But we pre-process the text and assume that we can reuse that index that we built many times, so searching for many patterns. This, this term index, like index finger, is, is a very old one. Uh, it's, it has the word pointer in it, which is really neat from a computer science perspective. Uh, it's, in a way, um, trying to, to build something that points you to the right position right away. And um, okay, I think I'll, I'll have this later again, but um, traditional books, uh, at least, monographs, textbooks, they often have an index at the end where they have certain uh, key topics or, or key terms that are listed, and then there's the pages on, on which they occur. That's very close to our task, except that it's a bit more narrow, and some person has to sit down to build the index um, meticulously. The whole idea is much more, more general. Uh, all search engines basically do that. Uh, if, you, if you look up some more specific databases, pretty much everything now has a search, and people expect that to be blazingly fast. You type and you, you're, you expect within milliseconds to see some results. Uh, it goes further than that these days. You expect it to pick up mistakes you made in typing, or you expect it to find things. If enough other people found the same thing by mistyping it the same way or using a synonymous word even, it goes much beyond that for search engines. Uh, we'll stay at the exact matching part for this unit. All right, uh, another important area that during the pandemic has risen to much more fame is, is all the bioinformatics applications of this. Uh, you, can, you can identify certain areas in genomes, genes, genes areas that get uh, translated to proteins, uh, and many other parts. Um, and one, one, just as a fun fact, if you want, <laughs> uh, one week after the release of the sequence of the, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus genome, uh, one week after that, Moderna started basically putting their vaccine trials into production. It took them one week to tailor their approach that they had developed to a new uh, virus. There's lots of computer science involved in that. Of course, a lot, a lot of other techniques and a lot of biology and lab, wet lab techniques as well. Um, but there's uh, a lot of searching going on for, for pattern and comparing strings. A classic solution is what in computer science we would call an inverted index. Uh, it's inverted in the sense that uh, a normal book has easy ways to jump to a certain page, say, and then you can find what's on the page. And the inverted index says, where do I find a certain word? And it tells you where the page is. So it's the opposite. Yeah, normal, normal book, you go from page number to text, what's on page seven, and now you can ask, I'm looking for this word, on what page do I find it? Uh, so that's a, a simple mapping of, say, a list of keywords to the pages where they occur. That's in the classic book, or of course, computer science we might not just have the page, but the exact index. If that's one long string, we can jump to a specific position in that string. There's some assumption that comes with this, which is totally fine for many applications. Namely, we know what strings are potentially searched for. If you think about books again, someone has to decide which words to put in the index, and and, and the, and all these uh, like um, very frequent words that also don't have a very specific meaning, they are not usually included. And if you would include them, they would occur so many times, it's basically useless. And so um, it assumes that someone decides what, what words to put in, and it assumes uh, that there are words to start with. Uh, so inverted indices usually go through the text. Uh, 
somehow have a mechanism to split that into words, say in the usual sense white space separates words for natural language text or say English text that would work fine. Uh, and um, often we do a, a, an additional step that we won't talk further about it, but uh, there's libraries that do that for English fairly well automatically. You go from a certain occurrence of a reflected word to the stem, uh, go from plural, plural to singular, go from conjugated verbs to the standard form. You may know your grammar better than I do, uh, what the appropriate terms are in each case. This is just to make sure that if you, if you look for go, you also find all these other occurrences that are logically the same, uh, same word. Um, now, in terms of a data structure question, how would you store this? So suppose you have collected the list of words that you would like to find in your text. And you're going through the text while you do this. So whenever you find a word, you know where it was because you're just reading that position in the text. Have you seen some data structure that would potentially be useful for that? Any ideas? Yeah, for example, some binary tree. Uh, in a way, it's it's just a dictionary. So you can use whatever whatever type of implementation for a dictionary you want. It's a mapping, right? It's a mapping from words to say a list of indices of all the occurrences. So, for example, a a binary search tree would be uh, one implementation. And uh, of course, because you're all starting to prepare for the exam. Already, you know that in the expected case, at least, that means logarithmic time. Well, side note, if you want that to be worst case, you can use a balanced binary search trees, binary search tree. I haven't discussed how these work, but I mentioned that they exist. And so, okay, just to make that explicit, the keys are the words and the values are lists of indices. Okay, as uh, I don't know, list of offsets maybe. I don't want to use the word index again. So the starting position of an occurrence of that word. That's what it's what it's meant. Cool, done. So uh, that's a short unit, right? There's a few things where we can improve on this. First of all, we are having a very specific dictionary. Now, I've already asked this question last time. So let me maybe just pull it up again. But you, you will have answered it already. And we already know what the result was. Namely, a lot of you don't know tries. <laughs> okay, you're changing your mind now. You've looked it up. <laughs> So uh, why don't we stop with the binary search tree? Log n is not too bad, but we will be able to do better. And the reason we can do better in this case is that we have a specific type of key. We have strings as keys, the words. And so we can exploit that this, um, this type of key is special to speed up the searches. The simplest way to do that is called a try. And um, so let me go over this slowly. It's, uh, it's, it's in principle a very harmless and simple data structure, and it's worth understanding how it works and what the trade-offs are. Uh, even though, I mean, the, the plain form we're discussing now, nobody uses, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a dictionary data structure that has strings as keys. I've already commented on this slightly, uh, slightly uh, awkward naming convention. It's spelled like in retrieval, but pronounced like try. Uh, to not have another word that sounds like tree. Um, and uh, it, it's based on character comparisons, or simple comparisons, uh, as we had it for, for string matching. Now there's uh, an assumption to make our life a little easier, namely that all the strings that we store are prefix-free, which just means no string is a prefix of another string. You can either get this if all the strings happen to have the same length, then uh, no string can be a prefix of the other. If they're all the same length, they, they, 
Uh, they just can't be. <laughs> uh, the other option is uh, you make it a convention and say there's an end of string marker. And um, depending on, on how much experience you have with low-level programming, this is actually not too far from what C represents strings like. There's a specific character in the ASCII character data in the ASCII character set, the zero, as a character. It doesn't map to any real character. It maps to the, the null character. And in, in low-level C programs, strings are represented as null terminated strings. So you have a list of all your characters, and then there's a special character saying you that's the end. Uh, other languages represent strings differently. They explicitly store an integer saying that's the length, that's the number of characters, and then there's a sequence of characters coming. Uh, both exist. Now, Java uses the version with the length. What does Python do? Uh, not 100% sure. I would suspect that a string might just be an array at the end. I'm not sure what they do. I'm not sure. Uh, I can look that up. Either way, on the theory side, both is fine. It's not a real um, restriction. We can always add such an end of word character. Uh, you'll see this dollar many, many times in this unit. So get used to it. That's just a way to write this end of word character. It, it's a character that doesn't occur in strings too often. <laughs> it's common use to use the dollar for this. Uh, and it's much more convenient to have this as some, something you can draw as opposed to this null character that doesn't have a printing, a, pr uh, a visual representation. But of course, you could just replace this with something else. Here's an example of such a, a set of strings where we added the character at the end, so they're all prefix free. And now, what is a try? Uh, a try is a tree where we have a root, and then uh, the child edges of each root are labeled with one character. So in this case, um, the alphabet for these strings is just A and B. So all the edges here are labeled with either A, B, or the dollar. We add that to the alphabet. I'll just write it as this in this weird way to emphasize there's an alphabet where uh, the symbol doesn't occur, and then we add it to that. It, it must be a new character. Right, so, okay, we have nodes, and we have edges with labels. And what's the deal with the labels? If you follow down some path in this, in this tree, let me mark it maybe, then you arrive at some leaf, and if you read aloud the letters A, B, B, dollar, you get the string that's stored at this leaf. Uh, the fact that we assume this prefix freeness means we always end in a leaf. If we had one string that was a prefix of some other string, then we would stop, stop reading and still be in the middle of the try. If we add this dollar marker, we always end in a leaf, so that's a bit more convenient. Then we can always say the internal nodes are never the end of the string, and the, the leaves are representing the actual uh, strings in the set. So far, so good. That's also all. Uh, that's, that's a try, or a standard try. Uh, as you can see, there are some nodes that only have a single child. And there sometimes is a long chain of such that just goes down to one leaf. So um, maybe you already smell that there's room for improvement. Uh, but that's, that's one way to do it. Now, if we wanted to find a string in this, remember it's a dictionary, we're supposed to be able to find a string. What we would do is just take the new string we're looking for, start at the root and traverse pattern, well, character by character, following the edge that's labeled with that character. If we ever get stuck that way, it means the, the key is not contained in the dictionary. So one example, um, so we're, we're checking is BB in the set. I would start at the root. I guess I have to add the dollar for, for that to make sense. So I would start at the root and follow down this path, reading the first B. I would follow another B, reading the second B. 
And now I want to read a dollar sign, but there's no edge with the dollar. So at this point, I'm, I'm falling out of the tree. And so the answer must be no, because I couldn't complete my search. Uh, had we been able to continue all the way down to a leaf, we would have found the string. And then again, um, as for dictionaries for binary search trees, the leaves will have another pointer storing the value that's associated with this. In the inverted index, the list of all occurrences. But that's just baggage we carry around, so I'll, I won't usually draw it. So far, so good. That's tries. Let's see. <laughs> Unlike some of these questions I had in the past, um, all you need to answer this question was on the previous slide. And uh, you can see the question, etc., on the on the thing. So I'm going back there. So this just requires uh, thinking and, and understanding of the structure. So I'm trying to test you on this. I have 25 votes, but how many people voted earlier? 50. So I'll keep it open, but I want to show the results already a bit. So it shows you that there's uh, there's some favorite questions, uh, some favorite answers, but a lot of questions have got some votes. Now it's a lot of an lots of answers. If I keep this open for too long, will you all gravitate towards whatever is the current majority? <laughs> I'm not saying that that's the right answer, guys. Uh, in, in fact, uh, <laughs> right answer is there. So the um, yeah, you know, you know, it's not useful to change your answer now. Um, the right the right answer is uh, linear in the length of the pattern that we're looking for, and let's let's briefly ex examine that again on the example that we've just done. We can just reuse the blue part. So Q in this case would be three, and by and large you look at three nodes, and then you know. Uh, you start at the root. And then you read one character from the pattern that decides which child you go to, or if you're already falling out of the tree. Um, uh, did I say that the query string occurs? I didn't say that. So uh, I might I might have to make this into a an O, right? Or we could say worst case. <laughs> the worst case is uh, it it has to go all the way. To the length of the pattern. You don't fall out of the tree early. So you consume one character at a time and visit one more node. 
That's why it's, it's roughly the length of the pattern that you need. You might get lucky and fall out of the tree early. That can happen. In the worst case, you have to follow down. And then you're either, you can either stop in the middle of the tree, but if you append the dollar sign, you will always either find a leaf or you fall out. Okay? So that's the cool thing about tries. Let me emphasize that, like, um, outside of the concrete question, search in tries is linear in the length of the pattern you're looking up. It's independent of the size of the try. Even if the try is the entire web, you can search for a tree with just four, four steps down this huge try. It's completely irrelevant how big the try is. I think that needs a bit emphasis because it's really amazing and it's completely impossible to do that with a binary search tree. It's only possible because we have strings here and we're, we're doing a lot of pre-computation, right? Okay, so um, if we're trying to find a pattern, what determines the search time is the length of the pattern and only the length of the pattern, maybe the size of the alphabet. Um, well, I'm assuming that's fixed here. That sounds great. Now I have another question for you. Yeah, we're making a, a lot of progress today, I know. Just clicking on buttons. It's the same setup, but this time we're focusing on the space usage. Again, you have the answer on the slides, may, uh, on the phones, maybe it's more useful to show the slide instead. Maybe we can get a few more votes in. This one seems more clear to you, so maybe I can, can start showing. Uh, at the danger of influencing the rest of you. <laughs> we have a peak for this answer, and that's the correct one. So, uh, theta of n times m for the worst case. What's more important for me is, is to point out uh, a how comes and b what does it mean. So if I'm, I'm going back to the picture, the, the worst case would be that essentially all strings look like, look like this, one long chain of unary nodes, single child nodes, all the way down to a leaf. You can get essentially that if you have a lot of differences in the early few characters of the strings and then long chains of whatever strings that just have to go all the way down. So by and large, you have for each string roughly its length in unary nodes. And that brings the, the total space to n times m. Uh, the absolute worst case probably is if every string has a unique first character that only occurs in this string, and then the rest can be arbitrary. It would just be appended. Uh, it would look like one, one big jellyfish or, I don't know, a star. Uh, dandelion. <laughs> okay, <laughs> enough uh, weird botanical metaphors. So is this good or is this bad? Uh, it's a bit... Um, depends on the point of view. That's the total number of characters together in all strings. And we need to store the strings somehow. 
So in a way, it's probably not easy to avoid spending n times m space uh, times, times the size of the alphabet in a way, or log of the size of the alphabet. We'll, we'll come to the compression encoding bits next time, next unit. The number of nodes is, is n times m. Now, if you assume that we store the strings separately and then build this try on top just for searching, then it's suddenly not so great. Then we have this additional. So we just double the space, or likely is that the constant factor hidden in this is, is actually a, a good deal bigger. Because these pointers, the, these nodes have to be represented with pointers, and they need to store the, the edge labels. There's a lot of overhead going into this. So probably this, this constant factor is, is much bigger than one. So we're storing our, our strings, and then we're storing a lot more on top just to facilitate these searches. That's not going to work if the size of the thing you have is, is really big. If you're trying to index the web, you can't afford to uh, store something that's a multiple times that size. And luckily, it's not, not necessary for this. So that's the, the next jump in the evolution of these data structures, from standard tries to compact tries. And the, the trick is really not, not that complicated. Uh, if, you, if you look at the situation from before, this worst case was all these long chains of unary nodes hanging down. Uh, and if there's a few in this example. Let's just get rid of only those. And there, in a way, we, we do that by just contracting them. So it's these two. That's squished into one edge. That's this edge. Uh, and this, this long thing here is, is squished into just this edge. So the, the trees, you can basically lay them on top of each other. You would still find how uh, each node corresponds to one node in the, in the standard try. But of course, now uh, we're, we're losing some information. We just replaced the long edge that contains a whole string by a single character edge here. So what, how do we know that this second B is, is there? Or how do we even know how long this chain of, of things we now pushed together into a single edge, how long that was? To recover that information, the nodes, the internal nodes in the compact try store a number. And that's the index in the string that the children compare. So the root always has zero, which says the first, well, index zero character is what determines the child of the root. But from then on, it could either go uh, one with one further up, like in this case, or it could jump to two, where we say all the strings in our dictionary actually agreed on, uh, if, if they have a B in the first place, they all agreed on the second place, on index one. Okay. So if you have this compact try, uh, first of all, if you start with the standard try, I think it's relatively clear how to get to this compact one. You identify all the chains of unary nodes, and you replace them with a single edge. And the, the numbers in these nodes is just the original depth. This node was a depth 2, 1, 2, so it gets a number 2. Uh, maybe this is another example. That's 1, 2, 3, and so it gets a 3. How do you search in the compact try if, if you don't have this anymore, if that's gone? How do you do the same search as before? Suppose we search for uh, BAB. So we would start at the root. That tells us compare the zero index character. So that's a B. We follow the edge that matches. Now we're comparing the second character, the character at position two, index two, another B, brilliant. So we go down here, and we have found our pattern. Except that that's not the string that's stored, because we didn't compare this index one character. So in a way, we can do the search as before. But when we reach the leaf, we still have to check the missing characters, because we have skipped some. We may have skipped some. So we still have to check if these do also match. Otherwise, it's a spurious hit. But that's the, only, that's the only caveat. Otherwise, the search works the same as before. 
it even got cheaper or it at least didn't get more expensive. We don't visit more nodes, we just got rid of some nodes. So the same, same statement as before holds. You can search in a compact try independent of the size of the thing. The only thing that matters is the length of the search pattern. And now, uh, as a computer scientist, this is, this is something that pops up so often, but uh, I want to spell this out in detail. If you have a tree and all the nodes are at least binary, have at least two children, then the number of nodes is never more than the number of leaves in that tree. That's a, it's a simple counting argument. If, if every node has, has slots for children and consumes one slot uh, because it has a parent pointer, you can set up an equation. How many internal nodes do you have? How many leaves do you have? By matching up the number of slots, taking into account that there's the root that doesn't consume one. So in a binary tree, it's always exactly one more leaf than internal nodes. And in the general case, if you can have even more than two children, uh, it's just an inequality. The number of internal nodes is at most the number of leaves, minus one. And the number of leaves was the number of strings. That's uh, the number of strings our try stores. So now we have a, a really useful bound. The number of internal nodes, these additional things we have to store to search quickly, that's now linear in the number of strings, not in the total length of all strings. So that's a bit more manageable. So in, in I should probably have put this uh, properly. So it's theta of n space independent of m, which was the length of the strings. All right. So tries are good because they can search fast, but they might, may use a lot of space. Compact tries make this, the structure a little more intricate with these contracted edges. Other than that, the rest works the same, and they get the space down to at least linear in the number of strings. So that's the two key bits. And uh, so let's wrap up with how, how well this works. We can use such a try as an inverted index. It's relatively simple to code that up. Uh, if you want to be really, really efficient, maybe you have to spend some thought, but it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward still. And it's quite fast to look up. For our original problem, there may be some things left open if we if we just have a list of words and we're storing a fancy dictionary, this is okay. Uh, if we're trying to search for just a part, a, a segment of a string, just a, a substring, or we want to find the occurrences of several strings uh, after each other, then the tries don't, don't really help us much. And even worse, if we have biological sequences or other, other more general binary data without a specific separation into words, then uh, the try doesn't help us because we don't know what to put into it. It's not so clear. Questions on tries? Let's take a little break and you can digest the try part. <laughs> that was um, a long motivation for this section. <laughs> well, we also discussed the exam. I'll give you precisely the five minutes. Okay, nice. It was probably four and a half.
Okay, let's see um, if uh, it's the failure link. Okay, the failure array starts at zero, so it, it has an entry for the zero one, even though that doesn't have a proper failure link. So this is the zero, that's the second zero, and this is the one. So that goes back to one. It shouldn't go back to zero. Why? Because if you get uh, A over here, so it's like if you get B, C, and A, then it will disturb these two. So we have so we again have to get three keys to continue the battle. That's true. Uh, in state two, you have only seen the two Cs. Yeah. So if we get a uh, failure, yep. so we should start with zero so that we can again continue to have three Cs. Because if, if we go to one, we will only end up with two Cs and it will disturb the battle. You're right, uh, but the KMP failure function is blind to this. So in a way, you're using additional knowledge. You say, the only way this can possibly continue is with a C. If there's anything else than a C, you will eventually go back to zero, no, no uh, question. Now, uh, the KMP failure function says, OK, I don't look at what comes. I only know this is where I am. And what could I possibly do next? I could align this C with the next C. So in a way, I, you're, you're using an extension. You're, you're um, using a smarter way to define this, this failure link. But it's not the way how the KMP algorithm does it. Well, like if you go to, to immediately back, back up, then okay, you, you can have an A. Then if you go to the previous state, that has a previous alphabet. Yeah, so if you have an A, what the algorithm would do, what the KMP automaton would do, it, it goes back to 1. And then it would see, oh, it's still not a C. Big surprise. It wasn't a C here, it's still not a C. And then it would jump back to zero. Okay, so it's, it's kind of, too hard. yeah. But if you look at the formal definition, uh, it's just looking at this, at this part. And how can you align this with itself? And then you can, you can put this C below this C so that uh, you only go one position back. So like for here, if we go 2, then 1, and then 0. Failure link on three. On three. Optimal mean. Uh, you uh, you have to choose the safe option if you want. Yeah. The the easy way. Um, this should should have been in the tutorial. Is this? Is this this week or that that should have been in the tutorial no long um longer ago. It was in tutorial five. Yeah. So it's the easiest way to find these failure links is to put the string you have and put a copy below and then just shift it the furthest you can where it still matches. Okay. So you put the same pattern and then match it. Yeah, so if, if you do this with three C's, right, then yeah. C C C you can put it one and it still matches. So it's just jump one back. All right, time to continue and time for the for the star of the show. In the next subsection, um, we'll look at suffix trees, which will turn out to be a versatile and really uh, useful data structure that's very easy to define, but hard to, hard to compute. And I called it a magic data structure here because very smart people essentially thought it's not possible at, at some point. And to, to motivate that, uh, here's a, an exemplary problem that we will come back to as well. It's called the longest common substring problem. You're given uh, a collection of strings, k strings, s1 up to sk. 
There's some example with two strings, uh, but it can be more. And we want to find the longest substring that occurs in all of these strings. So it's somehow a pattern that occurs in all of the strings at some point, at some location. And the longest such, please. So for these two, oh, you can, the second is not too long, so you can, can try to figure this out. Uh, it turns out to be a live that occurs here and here. And don't get tricked by this being different, different strings put together. Uh, so the, the question is if you just if you just have two, maybe you get around with just trying different options. If you have k strings, it sounds like this is even tougher. Uh, and the question is, can we do this by basically reading every string just once? That's what this time would be. It's the time to process all the characters. You can take a constant factor more, but that's, that's all you're allowed. Should that be possible? It sounds like uh, uh, it sounds unlikely because it, it feels like you have to test all possible combinations of positions or at least all possible substrings and check if they occur or something like that. And uh, it turns out that the suffix trees are able to solve it in that time. Uh, and it, it, if, you, if you haven't seen it before uh, but thought about this problem for a while, it, it feels like this is, this is not possible. So suffix trees are, are a way to do full text search in strings. They're linear time and space. So in, in a time and space to just look at the string once, you can build this. And you can solve this problem and many other problems in all, almost best possible ways, usually. And to further like um, give credit, to give evidence for this, there's a, a quote from, from a, a textbook on, on suffix trees and other related problems uh, that, that says uh, Don Knuth, that's the same Knuth from the knuth morris Pratt algorithm and well, famous for, for his, his books, The Art of Computer Programming, also the creator of the, the tech typesetting system and in a way um, a central figure in theoretical computer science for sure. So a while ago, uh, but yeah, so he, he thought about this problem as well and said, no, it's, it, it sounds like this is not doable. Uh, but he was proven wrong, which if you look at it from today is, is awkward because it sounds so easy to do with the building blocks we'll look at. So in two weeks time, you will know how to do it. Uh, but there's a few conceptual jumps in between that were really hard for people to take. Luckily, they're much easier to understand once people already know what to do. It's one of these cases where inventing something is harder than, than understanding it once the invention is out. So what is a suffix tree? Uh, the suffix tree is defined for a text. Um, and uh, we'll always add this dollar sign. So same, same convention as before, but we have a single string, a single text, but we add this dollar sign at the end, which will just turn out to be convenient. Um, and what we build is a compact try, what you've just seen, and uh, of what set of strings, all suffixes of this extended text. So you immediately see why the dollar sign is useful there. It means that this set of all suffixes is prefix free, which were, was what we needed. That's the definition. Uh, let's see some example. So here's a, a text, banana ban, um, with a dollar added. These are all the suffixes. So you just take the whole thing, delete the first character, delete the first two, the first three, and so on, all the way down. Uh, and you build a, a compact try. So I've just drawn this sideways so that we can write the, the labels of the leaves nicer. Uh, here's a conceptual view of the compact try that we'll sometimes use because it's a bit more human friendly where I, I wrote the entire string as the label on the edge. Remember from before compact tries they contract these these sequences of unary nodes and then they actually just take the first label and represent in the internal nodes how many characters did I skip. 
Uh, but we can conceptually write this by writing the full label on the labels. We know that in reality, this is what it looks like in... Okay, there's one more uh, before that, but uh, I'll come to that. Uh, in the computer, it's stored like this. We have the offsets in the internal nodes and just the first uh, label on each edge. That's the compact try part, but it's convenient to write it like this for, for us to reason about. And the second change is, if you look at this, it looks like it's storing this uh, parts of this same text over and over again. That's, of course, not necessary. You can store the text once uh, and instead in sto store in the leaves only the starting position of the suffix. That's enough. Then you know suffix 4 is, is everything starting at 4, so it's this naban. That's what it was. So a suffix tree is, is that, a compact, compact try of all the suffixes of the text but in the leaves, we store the starting index, not the full string. OK? There's also these, these three representations that we'll jump between. This one, where the internal nodes have the numbers and just the first label is on the edge, that's the computer representation, the one that one would want to implement to not waste space. Uh, this is the version that we'll usually work with because it's uh, easier for us to reason about with these edge labels here. And okay, the, the first one, the third representation is where we spell this out. Sometimes uh, I'll also use that. Questions on the definition? Uh, one thing I should say about tries, uh, I haven't pointed this out in the previous section. If you have a set of set of suffix, a set of strings or set of suffixes in this case, you can insert them one after the other in a try, and the resulting try doesn't change if you change the order of insertions. That's very different from the binary search trees, where you remember if we had the sorted order, it would be this completely degenerate case, and if you balance it more, then it would be nicely balanced. Not for tries. In tries, the structure is completely dictated by the strings, and so the order of insertions doesn't matter. That's one convenient bit. And so it means we can say we just have one specific try. The suffix tree in this case is, is well defined for just the string. You don't have to ask what's the order of insertion or anything like that. So that's all the magic uh, there is in the suffix tree. We'll come back to how to solve this, this cool problem that people thought is not possible in this, in this fast time with suffix trees. The tough bit about suffix trees is how to construct them quickly. And let's have a look at how to construct them slowly, but uh, simple. Uh, if we have a, a text of length n, so n characters, it actually has n plus 1 after we added the end of word character. Then we can build this suffix tree in uh, the simple route is take each suffix, insert it into a try, and at the end you have the suffix tree. So you could, um, the, the, most, the most straightforward way to do it is to build the non-compact try first then compact it, and then replace in the leaves all those pointers, uh, all the, the strings, by just the, the starting index. The problem is that this takes essentially quadratic time, uh, because the, 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 the first half of the suffixes, they all have at least n half characters, and you always have to traverse the try, so that alone uh, already takes quadratic time, even if you're not starting with the uh, standard try. So that doesn't work. And for now, we'll just leave it as a bla magic black box. The amazing result that we'll eventually come back to is you can construct the suffix tree in linear time. You're given the string, and there's a, a magic procedure that spits out this thing without going through a lot of effort. 
It's a little tricky to go into the details, but we'll build up to this. And this was the part that was not clear if it's possible. Because um, this, this construction, taking all the suffixes and building a try on that, that's straightforward enough for researchers to come up with um, before the time. But whether you can build it quickly, that was the part that wasn't clear. And so uh, that's, that's, the, that's the big box to look out for. Uh, for the moment, we'll just take that for granted and see what we can do with it. But we'll come back to it. Now, because um, many of you haven't seen tries before, uh, I wonder if it's useful if we construct this try from scratch to see how you come to this. Um, essentially to reinforce uh, the definitions of tries, etc. So this is not specifically about suffix trees, really, uh, but to give you a feeling how to do that. Banana ban. <laughs> OK, uh, I probably want the indices, but let's try. So we'll start with the standard try because these are these are easier to construct for for humans. And so again, the, the procedure I'm showing you now, that's the crappy slow algorithm. That's not what we want to use at the end, but it's the one that is uh, easier to follow. So we start by just inserting the whole string. So I'll need a lot of space for that. Let's try to be small. Ba. Na. Okay, I'll first write. Ba na. Na. Okay, I can make it a bit, bit bigger, right? It's a bit, bit extreme. Can't see much. Uh, and, uh, and okay, now I'm <laughs> used up a bit too much space here. It will probably be taller than than white. So let's let's see. And we need the dollar. Okay, this will this will be messy at the end. That's one string inserted. Now let's do another one. Let's do the one that starts with an A, so N N of N. That's going down this route with A. N N N Ben and the dollar. And then we have another another leaf. I'm leaving out the, the contents of the leaves. But what should go there is, is zero and then one. So that's uh, that's already the indices where we started. So the next one is nanoban. That's again uh, another link from the root. So that was B N. Nah. Nah. Ben. And the dollar. It's really tedious, but it gets faster because the strings become shorter. And now the first thing, uh, the first time something interesting happens, if we start with, with this one, we have Anaban, which reuses parts we've already built. We do A, N, A, but then comes Ben. That's an N. And the dollar. Great. Okay. Now, Naban. 
goes down this path, N, A, and then we fall off with Ben. There's nothing more uh, educative than doing a quadratic algorithm by hand and suffering real hard. Shows you much more why you don't want to use them. So we've done NABAN, next is ABAN. So we go down here and then we fall off with BAN. It also shows you that there's some pattern. That is, uh, I've, there's always this BAN at the end that seems to fall out of the tree. Now here's another one, just BAN. This is actually in the tree, but we fall off with just the dollar. Then an would go here and then fall off with the dollar. Is that seven? And just n fall off with the dollar. And well, just the dollar if we want. Falls off right at the top. Oof, that's the standard try. Now we have to contract that to get the compact one. Uh, fortunately, that's not quite as bad. Uh, and I'm, I'm drawing the human version, so we don't have to figure out the indices. So we have one, two, three, four children at the root. Let's try to draw that a bit neater, a bit neater. And so we can do A, B, N dollar, sort them alphabetically while we're at it. Now let's take the A branch. There's two children, one that needs a lot of space with an A, and the other is just ban dollar. So that will all be contracted into one edge. Okay, I'm writing very small now. <laughs> then let's continue like a depth first search. Uh, AA brings us, sorry, that's, that's an N, right? That was an N, I read it as an A. A, N brings us down here. And then that has another two children, A and dollar. And here we continue, we have uh, two children, one with N, one with B. The B is just one long chain, so we can directly write ban dollar on the edge and go to leave three. And the other one is actually also one long chain. I'll, I'll need more space on that edge because it's naban dollar and it goes to one. Okay, you see how this goes? Shall we continue the rest? I'll try to speed up a little. So we go B, that's actually a whole ban. So we're down here. Fall off with a dollar for six, and then we have a one long and a ban. And the dollar. That was the whole string. Then for the N branch, two children again, one with A, one with dollar, and that falls off right away. And this one branches out another time into N and B. So I'm at N, A, N, A, B goes down to ban. No note. There's one long edge. That was this one, four. And the other one is also one long edge going down to Naban. And the dollar. And two. And that's it.
So you both see in this example that it's painful to do the full thing. It's also visible that it has much less nodes, this compact drive. And apart from the human-based version that we write all the strings on the edges, that's the suffix tree. Okay? So it's, it's not too hard to construct these manually. It's just tedious. But that's the slow algorithm. We don't, we don't get the magic results from using that one. That doesn't scale with large strings. Good. So just assuming that this fast construction does exist, what can we do with it before we uh, bother to learn about it more? I have a fairly mean summary question that's trying to test you on your understanding of this definition. Okay, I'd love to start it. There you go. It's basically just to have that fresh in, fresh in mind before we use it. Interesting even split. I'll wait for a few more people. <clears throat> That's two thirty five. One more. Okay. So uh, let's see. We have some votes for most things. Uh, there's also many correct answers. Let me briefly recap. So um, uh, we we always put dollar sign at the end of t. That's correct. The size of the suffix tree is never quadratic. It's always linear. If it were quadratic, we can't possibly build it in linear time. We just need that time to write it out. The trick here is the, the tries uh, could be big, uh, but the compact try never is, especially if we store the leaf labels just with an index. The whole thing is, is linear time, so theta, theta n space. Uh, OK. T is a standard try of all suffixes of t, of t dollar is not correct because the standard is wrong, but a compact try is, is correct with this little, like, use the index in the leaves, not the full string. Uh, the leaves store a copy of the entire string. No, we can't do that. That would use too much space. So we just use an index. 
the naive construction where you've seen me struggle so much takes quadratic time in the worst case, but we can do much, much better. Uh, T has n leaves. That was a meaner, a meany, mean one. It's n plus one because we have added one more character. Uh, but yeah, apart from that, <laughs> it has one leaf for each of the suffixes. Good. With that, let's look at some applications of the suffix tree. Now that it's fresh in everyone's memory what suffix trees are, let's motivate why they are so, so useful and popular before we spend more time on thinking about how to construct them. Just to reiterate, we're storing suffix trees like this if you represent them in a computer. So that's if you want to analyze space and time, you should think of this. But for designing algorithms, we'll think of the representation on the right, uh, just because that's the same information, just stored differently and much more human friendly. A little uh, nitpick or extra little thing that sometimes is important and is, is not a problem. We assume that every internal node has a quick way to jump to one of the leaves. And just as a tiebreaker, we assume that every, every internal node uh, in here has a, a pointer to it, its leftmost leaf, which could be silly here if it's just the child, but you know, it could be um, <laughs> in all of these examples, it's just one edge. Oh, come on. Uh, in principle, the tree could be fairly big, the subtree of a certain internal node. And uh, it's not guaranteed that you can jump in one step to a, a child, uh, to a to leaf in all cases. Um, but uh, in, in our example, it actually is. <laughs> I guess it also depends on uh, how you order, order the children. We'll, we'll just make this assumption to analyze algorithms, uh, to make, make the, the analysis a bit easier. So when you have an internal node, you can quickly find one of the leaves in its subtree. Uh, I don't think I'm using this a lot, but sometimes just as a, an abbreviation, ti is the i uh, suffix, starting at position i. Okay. Now, before we... Before I present you the solution, maybe you can figure this out. If we have a suffix tree like, like this one, that's the same as on the previous slide. What does that tell us about uh, occurrences of this pattern A and A? I tease out the whole unit as saying, we'll do text indexing, we'll find patterns in the text quickly. And I've spent a lot of time talking about tries and suffix trees without making the connection. So it's time for that. Um, I'll, I'll show the big tree instead. Uh, the pattern is A and A. This one, I don't really ex expect you to see it yet, but I thought it's useful to first trigger you thinking about it before I give the solution away.
Okay, more more votes come in. Twenty seven. Do again the thirty five. One more, 34. Okay, awesome. So many votes for many answers. There's also many correct ones. Okay, as always, you resist the urge to change your answer much. <laughs> um, let's switch back. I mean, hopefully it doesn't tell us nothing. Uh, it occurs, the, it, it tells us that P occurs in T. I'll show you in more detail why. And it also tells us something about where, what indices. Uh, and we can de deduce from that how often. Let me just, uh, um, have that on the next slide, I think. But at least we want to draw this picture. So. What's the connection between a, a collection of all suffixes and pattern matching or, or string matching? Uh, the reason is, is just if, if a, a pattern P occurs in the text T, then it is a prefix of a suffix in T. That's just throwing some fancy words around. So if that's our text T and we have our pattern occurring somewhere, then there's a, a suffix of the text starting here. So that's some ti, where p is a, a prefix, occurs at the beginning. All right, great. What does that help? One thing I haven't emphasized about tries, but uh, you could have maybe figured that out yourself. You can actually search for things in the, in the dictionary that have a certain search as the prefix. Um, let me do that here first. So what happens if we just traverse with a and a in our suffix tree? Start at the root, a, n, a. We end up here. That's what happens. Uh, what does that tell us? Um, it tells us that First of all, we didn't fall out of the tree, so we didn't get stuck in some way. And following this green pointer, or just looking at the subtree here, we see there's two leaves. So there's some way to continue from A and A to a longer string that's stored as one of the leaves. In our case, the leaves are not arbitrary strings, but they are the suffixes of our text. So there are two suffixes in the text that I can find by reading a and a and something else after that. So both of these suffixes have a and a as a prefix, which says at positions one and three, there's an occurrence of a and a, and that's all the occurrences that there are. So in a way, the suffix tree encapsulates or the the subtree we reach by finding the pattern encapsulates everything we need to know about the matches in the text. That's why suffix trees are so cool. They have all that information tidily collected in one node, and then we just have to walk around this subtree. In a little more structured way, that's what I have uh, on this slide. So we we try to traverse with our pattern in the tree following the next edge when we can, like in our example, A and A went, went nicely through. 
And then there's, there's different cases what can happen. So we had example A and A, where colloquial, I would say, we traversed in the, in the suffix tree and we ran out of pattern. We reached the end of the pattern, A and A brought us here. And so if that's the case, we find all the leaves in that subtree, that's all the occurrences of that pattern. Now, um, there are also slightly different options if you have the, say, the pattern BA, you would start traversing this edge and then you're, you're stuck, you run out of pattern in the middle of an edge. I mean, figuratively speaking, it's a, remember it's actually a compact try, so you, would, you wouldn't really get stuck in the middle of an edge, but um, you could match a prefix of the edge label and then you run out of pattern. Turns out this is actually the same as if you were just going to the next, uh, next node below. If you just complete reading the edge and ignore that, uh, you also get all the occurrences are in the subtree. Uh, a different case occurs if we fall out of the tree. Um, say the pattern NB, we start here, we go here, and then B is not in the tree. There's no child edge to follow. That means NB doesn't occur anywhere. So uh, we can get stuck in two ways. We can get stuck at an internal node, like in this case then uh, there's just no child edge for this. There's um, a variant of this where we... where we can traverse an edge, but then we fall out at this point. Right? It, it, that's technically a slightly different case, but the same conclusion. If at, at any point we can't traverse with our letters because there's no child edge starting with that letter, or it doesn't match the remainder of the, the label of the edge, then we fall out and the pattern doesn't occur. Technically, there's a third case that we run out of tree, we continue reading the pattern and we reach a leaf and can't continue. Now it turns out this is, um, for our application, this can never happen. as long as our pattern doesn't contain the end of word marker. So normally we have a text and we assume we are looking for some actual string in the text, not something involving this, this dollar symbol. And so uh, if the pattern does not contain the dollar, it can't ever finish reading the label because all the labels leading to an edge must stop with dollar. That's the end of the text. So we can never really reach a leaf. So if dollar not in P. Uh, if, if you include that case, you can also handle it. It's, it's not, um, not necessarily a problem, but we don't normally have to worry about it. Okay, a uh, slight nitpick, how long does this take? So it takes us order P time, the length of the pattern to find that we're in one of those three cases. But then what do we do with that if we're in case two where we uh, have matches? We can find with this green pointer from before to the leftmost leaf, in constant time we find one occurrence. If the goal is to find all occurrences, then we have to output all occurrences. So we, we can't do that in just that time. So uh, if the problem is to find any occurrence, we can do it in order P time. If we want to find all occurrences, we have to walk through the entire subtree and output all leaves that we reach. And that can take more time if there are more occurrences than the patterns long, that's possible. <laughs> OK.
Okay, we've discussed most of these already. Um, some other examples. Let's come back to um, something similar to this opening question. That was straight string matching. In a way, we already knew how to do that. It's just uh, now that we can build the suffix tree once and keep it, it's useful if you have to search many patterns. But let's look at a different problem where the suffix tree is, is um, of much more uh, essential use. Uh, that's a, the longest repeated substring problem. We have one long string and we're trying to find some substring that occurs at another place. So we're trying to find a, a, a substring starting at position i of length l, we're looking for the longest such, so the, long, the biggest l, so that there's another position j where the same substring occurs. Okay. The formal definition is just here to emphasize the two uh, occurrences could be overlapping, which maybe uh, is not what you immediately would have expected. Uh, that actually has use cases that we'll come back to. So it's not just an esoteric puzzle if you want. How, how can we do this? Uh, we definitely don't want to check all substrings of the text and check if they occur. Uh, that would be really slow. Now, again, <laughs> suffix trees to the rescue. If we have something shared, some string that occurs twice, uh, picture. So if there was an occurrence of some, something here and here, I'll, I'll call this P, but it, it really just is a substring of the, of the text that occurs in two positions. Then there, there are two suffixes of the text starting here and there that start with the same string p. Two suffixes of t starting with the same text, the same characters. So this bit must have a joint path in the suffix tree because we're traversing uh, the, the suffixes letter by letter. So example, um, in our in our well, this is the running example for the for a long time, so get used to banana ban. Uh, we have a ban and a n. So there's two occurrences of just the letter a. That's one one repeated string. Now, if we look at a ban, a ban and a n, they have this shared common path that has label a. And that's no coincidence, it's always like that. Whenever you have an occurrence of something twice in the text, there will be two suffixes that share this thing as their common prefix. And that means there must be some internal uh, node that we reach from the root with label A, or in general, label P. So all we have to do to solve this problem to find the longest such repeated string is to go through all of our internal nodes and check if there are two leaves below them. Then the path from the root to that internal node is a repeated substring. To reformulate the question, the longest repeated substring in a text is the same as the longest common prefix, the longest prefix that's identical occurring in two suffixes, okay? And uh, well, you can, you can narrow it down further, um, but it's, it's two leaves. How can we exploit this? We first of all compute the, what's called the string depth of all the nodes. That's just the number of characters that I have to read from the root to reach that node. In a compact try, you don't have to do that. It's actually the number that's already in that node. But let's do it here because we're storing the human-friendly version. We have to read one A to get here. The root always has string depth zero. One character to get here. Three characters to get to this one. A N is two, another is three, and another two for this one. That's all, all internal ones. 
if you worry about how to do that, again, you don't really do it. In the compact tree, you already have it. Otherwise, you could do a traversal of the tree, uh, a recursive function that remembers the current depth and passes it down. And then the second step for finding the longest repeated substring is to just pick any node that has maximal string depth. So we could, for example, take A and A. That's one of these. And then the path to that node from the root, A and A, is one of the maximal repeated substrings. And A and A occurs uh, in the suffix anaban and ananaban. So it, it occurs in two places and it's actually overlapping, right? If you, if you look at banana, there's ana and anana. Okay, do I have to write this down? So the two occurrences are Anna and Anna. They, they reuse the A, so the two are overlapping. But that's all right, that's, that's allowed. There's a second equally long repeated, subs, uh, repeated string. If you pick this one instead, also has string depth three. That's Ban. And it tells you, look at position six and zero. Ban, Ban. Right? Magic, right? Uh, no, of course not magic. It's the definition of the suffix tree. Uh, but the, the tricky bit again only is finding the suffix tree. Once you have the suffix tree, this algorithm is, is fairly simple to do. Computing the string depth is not hard, and finding the node that has largest string depth is also not hard. So we can do it in linear time after building the suffix tree. We're almost, almost there to solve this original problem. Um, the only thing that's missing is suffix trees so far are just for a single text. And the other problem, remember, was the longest common substring. You have several texts and you, you ask, what's the longest thing that occurs in all of them as a substring? For that, you somehow need to have a suffix tree for several strings. But it turns out that's actually not hard to do. Um, there's a, a, a simple way to, to reuse the suffix tree as a black box and get this done. And that's, that, I, that trick is known as the generalized suffix tree. Uh, all you do for that is define a text like this. So you take all your individual texts, t1, t2, and so on, and you add different dollar signs after each. So you, you reserve a new marker to say, that's the end of text one, that's the end of text two, and so on. And then you build the suffix tree for this, for this new text, ignoring that it is composed of these individual texts. And if you look at the resulting tree, you will find that there's always some dollar $j edges that lead to leaves, just because they occur in only one place. So uh, you can always find for every for every suffix of every text, you find one leaf. So in a way, the, the very same trick works. Uh, it's just um, a neat little, little extra idea that, that's needed for that. Um, because we're running short on time, I don't think I'll, I'll do the question, but uh, let's, um, let's just do it together. I mean, this, this three strings, What's the longest common substring? Because this last one is so short, uh, we can just brute force it in a way. So BC occurs in all, I can see that here. But BCA also occurs in all three. Good, so BCA should be it because BCAA doesn't occur. Okay? Uh, yeah, I think that question never was uh, that useful, but uh, wake up time, you know, and so on. So how do we do the longest common substrings with this? Uh, let me show the example. Um, maybe the algorithm we don't have time to discuss in detail. That's the generalized suffix tree for these three strings that we've just seen in the, in the example. And so you see there's um, 
all the suffixes of all the strings must be there. So there must be a a from this third, for example. So you could follow a and a. And then there's an edge with $3 telling me, oh, this is a suffix of the third text. Um, there are more, more occurrences of AA in text 2, so you could also have AABCA, AABCA, that brings you to that one, and so on and so forth. So the way to construct this is put all the texts uh, behind each other, concatenate them, and build the suffix tree for that. Now, how do we find a string that occurs in all three texts? There's one extra, extra trick in this tree. That's these green numbers. The green numbers just mean there is some leaf below this node that has the appropriate dollar index. So the one, two, three here means I can find a one and a two and a three among my leaves. Whereas for this node, the one, two means I only have a one and a two. I don't find any dollar three below me. If we have that information, we can find a deepest node in terms of the string depth, same as before. And I already put the string depth in, in the, the nodes. So this one, this one looks like the deepest, right? Uh, it has a three. We look for the deepest node that has all green numbers, because that means the string I can read from the root to this node, I can continue that and reach all three texts. So there's a way to extend that string to a suffix for each of the texts, which means it occurs in each of the texts. And here that's BCA, which we figured out before. All right. So that was, the, that was the quick version. Uh, I spelled it out in, in detail as code. It's basically describing in, in several steps how to compute the green numbers, how to compute the string depth, and then find the deepest node in terms of string depth that has all numbers. Uh, there's not much more going on there. And the only tricky bit really is to construct the suffix tree again. All right, cool. So you've seen uh, some immediate applications for string matching and some more advanced applications where we really use the inner workings of the suffix tree to maximal extent. <laughs> Remember, no lectures next week. We continue in two or one and a half weeks, Monday after that. Um, and tutorials, keep an eye on, on Campus Wire. Normal tutorials this, week's, this week. Tutorials next week, Ben will let you know what you're doing. Um, my information is he might want to have this extra slot for the bamboo assessment, tell you about his favorite puzzle. <laughs>